Okay. Okay, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Mastery Podcast. Today, um, we're at episode 127, and this is a very, very special episode, um, I'd say, selfishly for me, um, but it is going to be incredibly rewarding for you guys, inspiring, um, and going to help you uh, along your journey as the whole purpose of the Mastery Podcast is just to support you and guide you and help navigate through your career as a fitness professional. Today, I'm uh, joined by Dr. John Demartini. Um, I'd say good afternoon in South Africa, John. Yes. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to be on your show. Thank you. Well, I know you speak to a lot of people, teach a lot of people, a heck of a lot of people all over the world, um, and uh, may not remember uh, that I was at your last bright breakthrough experience in London uh, with yeah. my wife. Um, yeah. An incredible, life-changing experience for us. But I first um, came across your work when you had only just um, uh, co-authored, would you co-author with the, you weren't the co-author for The Secret, but you were a, a contributor into The Secret, am I correct? Yes, around 2000, I think in six, we, we first filmed a movie of yeah. the secret and then they turned into a book around 2008 i think 2007 well, maybe i i was gifted by a client of mine uh, at the time the book the secret and a colleague of mine at the time and i said there's one of the gentlemen that's in the secret was speaking at a um a, a seminar in london you were talking about neuroscience and uh, i had the privilege at that time in my very in my early 20s to be first introduced to your work and i'm now 42 and so your work has been hugely impactful. So just before we get into the podcast, I'd just like to say thank you from me uh, for your work. And everybody who's listening to the podcast is now going to experience um, what your work is. Um, so thank you, John. Well, thank you. Um, now, you are a specialist in human behavior and mindset. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, for those of you listening to the podcast who don't know who Dr. John Demartini is, um, I know him as, as he reminds us every time we speak as a researcher, a traveler, um, uh, an, an author, and, and a human behavioral uh, specialist in, in your field. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on that, John, and just give everybody listening to the, to the podcast who isn't familiar with you uh, a little kind of overview of who you are and uh, what your mission is in the world? Well, 47 years ago, um, almost to the day, I had a dream to travel the world and become an educator, primarily in the area of maximizing human awareness and potential and the involvement of conscious awareness and achievement. And I set out to do that when I was living in Hawaii. That led me to a journey of exploring and studying and learning, you know, I, I've voluminously been reading 30,310 books right now. And uh, I've been doing everything I can and studying every field I can to try to give the most concrete information, grounded information to people do extraordinary. And I've been blessed to travel the world. I've been 153 countries and I full-time travel, as you know, and I just do whatever I can to help people in presentations and do a lot of medium. Today I have 10 interviews. So that's wow. a typical, that's a, that's a little bit more than typical, but I, I've seen it up to 21. I've seen it down to three, but I do interviews and try my best to share as much information for my research as possible. And I had the absolute privilege of, of, uh, if everybody comes, anybody comes to see your work, they will see what your, the, the lengths and depths that you're prepared to go to, to help someone, to uh, either have a breakthrough or achieve a, a level of fulfillment in their life. And I, and I watched that and I listened to you and we were with you in the evening. And uh, I actually noticed in the fitness industry how little lengths a lot of fitness professionals will go to to actually help people who are struggling to improve. It's a lot of the fitness industry is based on a session. They do a session, it's done. Um, your, your work is never done until, until you've been able to help somebody kind of connect the dots. What, what are we right in saying that? Yeah, I'm uh, on a relentless pursuit of, I could say, um, mastery and, and whatever that individual is 
inspired to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what they're going to come in with. When I do the my signature program, I teach 76 courses, but one of my signature programs is the Breakthrough Experience. And when people come in there, they could be already highly seasoned veterans of a field, maybe very celebrated celebrities in, in acting or in sports or in business, or they may be somebody just starting out. I, I don't always know what I'm going to face. But all I know is that whatever it is that's their innermost dominant thought that they really truly want to create, I'm interested in unveiling that, clarifying it, and structuring, helping them structure their lives so they can prioritize their actions to get that. Mm -hmm. And showing them how to transform the perceptions of extrinsic activities or experiences that they think are distracting them from that focus and help them use it where it's on the way, not in the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I am kind of a relentless guy. I've been known to stay up till five in the morning working with people on a weekend to um, get the job done. As I, not my preference to work as late that way. I just want the result. You know, I'm, I'm committed to the result. That's it. Well, on that, I think it's a very important for us to flow into that because the, the pursuit, the desire for, for mastery, for self-mastery, but to pursue an end goal. A lot of coaches will to be in this industry and wanting to achieve the best for their clients. And you have a purposeful focus and mission that you are on this, this planet to help people to achieve. Why do you think people in their chosen profession don't go all in and do everything that they can to help somebody to achieve a result? Well, <clears throat> I think that intrinsic drive is a, degree is, is proportionate to the degree of the congruency between your intentions and what you truly highly value, your highest value. If you're doing something and you've been able to delegate all lower priority things and able to just focus on the very highest priority things, you'll end up having a momentum building acceleration and focus that will be somewhat unstoppable. But if you're still in the phase where you're haven't quite delegated things and you're having to be trapped doing some of the activities that are less than inspiring, if you can say it that way, uh, you may wear yourself down with entropy and not, you know, build momentum and have this incredible unstoppable drive. I've been blessed to be able to, uh, after learning basic things on delegation, to prioritize my life where I'm only doing the things that are absolutely inspiring to me. And I've delegated the rest. I have, teams around the world that help me do everything that I am not wanting to do. Basically mm -hmm. I, um, anytime you're doing things that are lower on your value structure, you're automatically going to devalue yourself. Anytime you're doing the very highest things, you inspire yourself. Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed to structure my life in such a way that I've got enough people to take care of everything other than what I love doing. So I, I, I structured that way. I've worked towards that and I've achieved it. And I love, you know, obviously over the years listening to you and how you've developed that. And, and I've, I, th this question that I have for you is exactly based upon that. When somebody is new to the whole world of personal development and self-mastery, there is a vast amount of information, books and resources and places that people can go. And the journey to self-mastery, as you said, it, it, it's never ending. It, it's a lifelong commitment to pursuing that. If you were speaking to personal trainers and fitness professionals right now and, and on online coaches, many people who are unaware of what self-mastery and personal development is, delegating, having your understanding your highest values is, is hugely important. But where would you advise somebody start? Everybody's asking me all the time, you know, what's the best book to read? What's the best this to do? Where's the best person to go? I always recommend, obviously, the work that you've done. It's been so instrumental in my life. But where would you say the first stepping stone to becoming, to, to learning self-mastery and personal growth? Well, as far as a book, if somebody asked me what book to get, um, I would have to say, and I know this is not going to match everybody's needs, but I would have to say that Mortimer Adler, who wrote the book Syntopic in Volumes 1 and 2, by, published by Britannica as part of the Great Ideas series, it's a summary and synthesis of the topics 
that had been explored by the greatest minds through history over the last 2,700 years, summarized and condensed and highly integrated topically. And, and um, it's the best ideas of the best minds. And I think that that's a PhD in life, the, the devouring of those two volumes. They're about 800 page, pages each, but they're, they're two masterpieces. I would recommend those two books. As far as an action step, um, the most significant action step that I can encourage somebody to do if they're starting out, this is the thing that this action step took my business from me, myself, and one assistant to 12 doctors, five, five doctors, pardon me, and 12 assistants and a thousand square foot to a 5,000 square foot growth in 15 months yeah. and a tenfold increase in income. So I'd like to share that if that would, would be okay. I'd love you to. Yes, please. So what you do is you get a piece of paper out or a series of them, or you get on your computer and divide a piece of paper up on your computer of, into six columns. In the first left column, you write down every action you do in a day. And I don't mean general, vague, broad things like marketing, advertisement, you know, sales. I need the very detailed action, the moment by moment actions that you're actually doing in a day and list that as comprehensive as you can. And take any action that might occur over a three month period, because some things you may do once a week, some things you may do three times a week, but I want every action you do that you might do over a three month period. And be exhausted. This could be personal at home or professional at wherever you work. And list that, that's the first step. And take a look at what you actually spend your day doing. And be honest, to be objective and don't leave anything out. In the second column to the right of it, now write down what does it produce per hour? What does the actual action produce and generate as income per hour? Mm -hmm. And you probably think, well, not everything does, and it probably won't. But I want you to be aware of that, because anytime you're doing something that devalues your time, you're gonna devalue your perception of yourself and lower the quality of the clients you're gonna get. So you write down exactly what you make per hour doing that. And you have to do an extrapolation because you may spend 20 minutes on it, multiply it times three, or spend two hours on it, divided by half. But find out what it produces per hour. This will be eye-opening. It'll make you realize you're majoring in minors and minoring in majors. It'll make you realize why you're self-depreciating and scattering yourself and feeling overwhelmed at times. It'll make you realize why you don't have the time to go and do the highest priority actions that generate business and develop leads. And you'll find out that you're doing administrative things that are uninspiring, probably, and you're not doing the absolute highest priority actions that give you the greatest results and produce the most income. Mm -hmm. By me doing that at age 27, almost eight, that's when my, my career really catapulted. And once I did that, I reprioritized that list based on what produced the most per hour. And I was a doc at the time, because I wanted to be a teacher, healer, and philosopher. And in, uh, in that moment, I realized that me actually sitting in a cubicle and actually interacting with patients was not the higher and highest value hour I could make. It was more effective to go out a presentation to a group of people and generate new clients my case visit average was about $3,000 a, a case. If I go out and get five or 10 new patients or clients in an hour talking, um, I will generate you know, $15,000 to $30,000 in an hour, where if I was in my actual practice in a cubicle, I might make $1,500 an hour. And so I stopped and I really had a paradox change. Cause I, was going, I went you know, 10 years to college to be also a professional, even though I knew I wanted to speak. I spoke all the way through school. I still wanted to be a professional. But here I am, that very action is actually undermining the growth of my business. So I then realized that I had to prioritize that list of what was producing the most to the least. And that's when I decided I need to hire doctors to work for me to delegate that clinical stuff, train them and master training them on the clinical things that I know and get out there and generate new clients. And that led me into radio and television shows I started having my own television show to generate millions of people exposure in order to get more clients and then delegate the doctors to leverage and only work with the highest priority clients, only the ones that have the biggest influence and prioritize the clients 
to the docs and train them and keep them rotated. So no one patient was associated with any one doc, it was rotated. And then the third column after I did that was how much meaning does each have, each of these actions? On a one to 10 scale, what was the meaning of each? And uh, I found out that some of the things were very low meaning, but they were things that had to be done and things were very high meaning. I found a correlation between the things that I love doing, obviously, and the meaning. And I found that there were, I had to go and make a list after I made that list of what the meanings are on one to 10 scale. I then reprioritized that list according to what was most meaning to least meaning. And then I linked and prioritized the two, the most productive and the most meaningful, and reprioritized that. And that was extremely eye-opening. It made me realize now I know very concisely, very clearly the things wise for me to do and what to delegate. That was very important. In the next column, I wrote down what is the cost if I was to delegate this? If I was to hire somebody who is completely competent, could do the job equally as well as I did, because sometimes my ego would get in the way and I think only I can do this. And by the time I could do it, I, or to delegate, I could have just done it. I had all these blocks at delegation. I, I wrote down all the cost and that was the, the, the equipment, the depreciation schedule, the training, the office space usage, the parking, every cost in addition to the salary of what it would cost to have somebody do that action and to the same standard. And when I did that, I again looked for spreads between what it produced per hour versus what it cost to delegate, to look for the greatest spreads and then re-prioritize uh, that according to spreads. So now I know where I'm gonna produce the most income and what to be delegating based on what I could produce the most to generate the most income uh, the fastest and to be able to have the most trained and free me up of doing things that are not inspiring to me that are not meaningful. So I reprioritize now all three, the meaning, the productivity, and the spreads. And that gave me a really very clear idea, again, of what to delegate and what to be hiring and what sequence and what uh, step by step, who first, who second. I then went over to how much time I averaged per day on each of these items. And I found out that sometimes I was spending 20 minutes, sometimes I was spending hours on it. And on the final column was the final prioritization, factoring all the variables. And when I got that final uh, thing down, I then layered that, tiny, that final prioritization into 10 layers. And I hired the lowest layer and hired the person. And I had to learn how to make sure that I got somebody who had high on their values, the very thing I need to delegate. Yeah. So I wanted the job description to be clearer from the action steps and make sure I hired somebody that was had a history of doing that, was inspired to do that, so I didn't have to micromanage them. And sometimes it would take me two or three people to get that person, mm -hmm. but it didn't matter. Once I'm done, I'm freed and I can, I can get on with the higher uh, part of the ladder. So over the next uh, you know, 15 months, I delegated all that. And I, I layered it one layer at a time, hiring one individual at a time. Maybe a couple times I got two, but most of them one at a time. And um, the second I had somebody that was able to do that, I was freed and I was able to get onto the highest priority things and have more time, more energy, more meaning, more productivity, bigger spreads, doing the highest priority things and delegating the lowest priority things. Anything I can get a big spread on, I delegated. Anything I can get focused that's meaningful, I did. And my business tenfolded and in 15 months, um, it went from one individual working for me to, you know, five doctors and 12 staff members. And I was in a 5,000 square foot place um, and was cranking it. And I had my own lecture hall for doing presentations. So I didn't have to go in out to do it. I just had ongoing presentations. I went out there and I started putting megaphones out into the parking lot where we were. And there was a giant cinema complex in this mall area. And I had the attention of 700 cars every night. And I was doing presentations with megaphones out there and lights <laughs> across the sky. And I was bringing in patients, you know, kind of get a kazooie and I expanded. So I was willing to able to do the most important things. And I found that, you know, we leverage ourselves by public speaking and for not exposing ourselves to ever greater leverages of public speaking, we're going to limit our business. Because referral is fab fabulous. And I love referral. I want that but I don't want to limit it to only referral. I want it to be able to be stimulated so there's plenty of new people coming in in addition to referral. Mm -hmm. And I can put layers on that because 
there's no limit on what we can do to make a contribution. Uh, and there's no limit on the income as long as we're willing to make an ever greater contribution. So I just kept expanding that. And that went around the city and then around the state, around the nation, around the world. And now I'm, I do that consistently today, the same thing. Still doing the highest priority actions, which is, uh, in my case, learning and sharing in every possible vehicle I can on a daily basis. That's very insightful. Thank you for sharing that. The link for me there to help personal trainers is going to be the thing that got you to say, I need to make a change now. I, I, you know, you were, you were busy, you were delegating, you were time poor. And then you said, no, 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 there's a framework that I've got to put in place to be able to give me this opportunity to leverage myself, bring other people in, delegate work. You talked about values, the, the areas of your life that are highest on your values, maintaining an ability for you to keep inspired on the vision and mission that you have. What was it at that time? Was it an awareness of your vision and an awareness of your values or in a realignment of your values that made you suddenly go through that whole delegation matrix because you knew you wanted to pursue a greater. I knew when I was 17 years old, uh, in fact, today's the 14th in four days from now, it will be 47 years ago that I had my clear vision. And I saw that I wanted to travel the world and I wanted to teach. I want to be involved in teaching, healing, and philosophy. I want to help people in personal development as a result of the gentleman that I met that night. And um, I had a dream to step foot in every country on the face of the earth and share what I learned with people. I had a learning problem up until then, and I wanted to overcome that. I wanted to learn and then share, because I figured that the faster I learned it, the faster I shared it, the more I retained it. So I've, had a, I've been on a relentless pursuit of this master plan since I was 17. And so I knew when I was got into practice that that was a stepping stone. That was part of the master plan that I'd start building. And I started writing out the master plan at 17. And I've been working on it. It's a 5,000 something page document today of exactly what I want to create, how I want to create it, and the metrics showing that I'm creating it to get feedback so I can refine the master plan. And I've been working on that uh, 47 years. So I, it's, it's something I had envisioned then I knew that my practice was just a starting point, but I knew I wanted it globally. I even had uh, in my office, first office, I had a map of the world, a cosmos map, and I had uh, 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 clocks from every country, major country and time zone around the world in my office, because I already said that I'm going planet, planetary wise. I had a, a, a painting, it sits in my office now, that is a magnificent painting of, of uh, you know, my master plan, you might say, of me speaking across the world. And it's, it's got a major icon building from every major city in the world in the background. So I'm, I've been clear about the, that path you know, for 47 years, that's no question. And I used every vehicle I possibly could. I knew that, it, that I was gonna limit myself one-on-one -on -one, and I had to use leverage. And leverage was radio and television and podcasts and magazines and newspapers and so I have basically I do about a thousand interviews a year. Uh, I got, I'm doing 10 today, 10 different uh, radio, television, podcasts, interviews, or whatever, media, television. So I, I do that day. And that way we reach literally hundreds of millions of people a year. And that allows me to leverage this thing. Now, I, I've very recently gone through uh, Voids of Values again with Clarissa. Um, which is, with, again, another experience for me to, to, at this stage, I'm 42 now, to keep revisiting my vision and where I'm going. And when I was at the age of 24, um, a lot of the work that I learned from you inspired me. I had this 23, 24, this vision that appeared. And you talked about the fact that you knew at the age of 17 that that's what you wanted to do. I had that. It, it's, I was sat in a coffee shop one day and suddenly this rush came through to me that I knew what I wanted to do. Every single day, I come across coaches, professionals who will be listening to this podcast that just don't know. It, nothing's come to them yet and they struggle to know what it is that they want to do or what their greatest gift in the world is. What would your advice be to someone that hasn't had that presented to them yet and how would they find out? Well... Pardon me for doing something as you're speaking here. I'm listening, but I'm, I'm going to send you something here. I'm going to send it if I can. 
Oh, we're on, we're not on, we're on Zoom, aren't we? Yeah. I can't, I can't, pardon me, I thought I could send it to you. I can send it by email. Thank you. you mind if I send you by email? Not at all. Let me have uh, your email address if you could. No problem at all. It's Mark with a K. Okay, let's see if I can find it here. Hold on a minute. Okay. M A R K at M at M one zero M one zero fitness dot co dot UK fitness after fitness dot co dot UK dot C O dot UK C O dot UK. Let's see if I can send this picture and get it there. Okay, let's hopefully that gets to you just now. We'll just see if we can do that. Okay, now you asked me how does a person identify uh, their their mission on my website and what you just mentioned. You worked with on Clarissa and also in Breakthrough. I, I believe the wisest place to do is to do a really objective evaluation of what you value and what your life demonstrates is important to you. Because your mission is a, an expression of what you spontaneously are inspired from within to act upon. I call it the calling sometimes. Uh, whatever you do every day that nobody has to remind you to do, that you're inspired to do, that you love doing, your mission is going to revolve around that because that's where you're not going to let yourself down. That's when you're going to get accelerated and build momentum. And so I have a 13 questionnaire, 13 question questionnaire that I ask people to get it narrowed down to what's really valuable to them. If it's done properly, it can nail it pretty, pretty tight. Once they identify what's really most valuable, then they got to ask the question, uh, how can I get handsomely and beautifully paid to do that? Then ask, what is the highest priority action I can do today that can make me move in the direction of achieving that? And if they work on the highest priority actions every day towards that achievement, it's impossible for them not to get closer every single day. And as they do, they start building momentum and they start opening up the executive center and start to see a vision of what's possible of how they can achieve it and it keeps expanding. So they, they, they start there because if they're not doing something that is absolutely inspiring and they're comparing themselves to others and think, oh, I'd like to do like them, they're doing well, they're making money and stuff. And they're not doing something that really is inspiring to them. They're not gonna have the competitive advantage that people who are inspired to do it will have. And many people get into a job. When I was in professional school, I was curious because a lot of people were going to school not to learn, but they're going to do to pass a test to get a degree so they can make a better income. And I was astonished at how challenged these people were trying to get through school. I was excelling through school because I already could see myself serving people. I already saw in my, my vision what I wanted to do. And I deeply wanted to learn the material. I didn't want to do a pass the test. I didn't give a damn about a test. And I always aced the test. I got hundreds on the test because of it. They were looking at passing a test. I was looking at how I was going to serve the world. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't access what that inspiration is, you know, you'll be struggling because you'll be having an internal conflict between what you think you would love to do versus what you think you're supposed to do. And you're trying to be somebody you're not. And that inauthenticity eventually erodes the momentum. Did you get the picture by chance? I did. What an incredible picture. I don't, what know, if incredible. Can, I don't know if you can put that on there. I have no idea how that's done on Zoom. No, because I'll, I'll find a way. When I put it, I could actually add it to the video as we're talking at the timestamp when we talk about it. Because I think yeah. for people to for people to see it, um, did, did did somebody uh, obviously somebody did somebody commission? Did you commission that? What happened? I was speaking in Melbourne, Australia, a number of years back, and I was telling them about the vision. I was actually reliving the vision in 1972 that I had, and I was describing it just vividly with tears in my eyes because it was a real experience, a vision and uh, epiphany. And, and uh, as I was describing it at the end of my presentation, a gentleman came up to me and says, I'm a painter. If I was to paint that vision, would you allow me the honor to paint that and give it to you as a gift? And I said, well, that'd be more than inspiring. If you can capture my vision, that would mean, mean a lot to me. Well, he did. And he, by God, captured what I saw. It was an amazing inspiration. 
And uh, when he brought that to me, I was just brought to tears. He unveiled it at a live presentation in front of 1,400 people in Melbourne. At the next, it was a number of months away, but he, he came and he, he, as a gift, he gave it to me. And the whole room was in tears. And the whole room was, it gave him a standing ovation for capturing it. So it's a, it was a That's special amazing. moment. And it sits in the entrance of my office. So when you come in, you see the vision. It's and that vision incredible. Is, is what I see every day. So those were the vision flourish, as they say. Those without a vision perish. If you want to be the great trainer and you want to be the one that, that leaves a mark and you want to create a, a, a real, you know, legacy kind of impact, mm -hmm. any detail you leave out of the vision is an obstacle you'll face in that journey. You got to get really clear and concise about what you're envisioning to do. You want to think of the highest priority actions on a daily basis and get really clear on the plan. Uh, don't leave it to chance because other people will dictate your destiny if you do. And delegate. You ha you're not going to get there without delegating and because otherwise you're limited on your, your, your hours. And you want to make sure that you can get the most leverage out of it and serve the most people and train people and and, and really have a mission to serve vast numbers of people. It, without that, there's no great income, there's no great legacy, there's no really great anything. And on that, it's, it, it, it really links in very nicely with, it, with actually a question I have on that. I've asked various different fitness professionals before we came on to today, what, what, what would you love to learn from, from Dr. John? And, and one of the things was, there's that much content out there in the world, that much to learn, that much to absorb. As a personal trainer, there's functional medicine, as you, as you were speaking about, you know, things to do with therapy, the, the spine, mobility, flexibility, nutrition. And a lot of fitness professionals feel like they're being pulled from pillar to post. The whole world, the word that you've talked earlier about is overwhelm. And I kind of guess at the answer to this question, which is how do you avoid being pulled from pillar to post from all the information that's out there and becoming overwhelmed is by staying aligned with what it is that your, your mission is and what your vision is. And so that you're not doing things that aren't congruent with where you want to go. Would I be right in saying that? Yes. I'll give you some, some ideas on this that I found helpful. Whatever you're studying, ask before you begin to study it, how specifically is devouring this information going to help me fulfill my mission on earth and answer that question a minimum of 30 times and don't read it until you've done that until you know what the content of what you're about to read the topic how's it going to help you on your mission because once it's linked to your highest mission you'll absorb the information in an accelerated rate because we tend to have a, a desire to absorb information when it's congruent with what we value most yeah. we know that when we read things it's uninspiring to us it's hard to remember anything but when we read something that's inspiring to us we engage in it so first, link it. The second thing is build a philosophy. Don't try to be somebody you're not by the whoever's writing it. Build a philosophy and start putting a puzzle together that's your unique puzzle, that's an original piece that you're building, and extract bits and pieces, giving references to those pieces if necessary, so you're not uh, stealing from them or plagiarizing. But put the puzzle together and build a unique package. I'm constantly refining overall my programs and every time I read a book I was reading another book here at lunch today right I'm reading two of my here as I'm in between everything I'm doing and as I'm reading anytime I get a glimpse appropriately place or building kind of a master um, presentation and structure if you scatter your information and don't integrate it and immediately put it into operation It'll, it'll just be stuff that you'll have to relearn again and it won't have a place in your mind and you don't know what to do with it. Everything that I read has a purpose. It has an objective. It's linked to my mission. I have a place where I put it into my ba bag of knowledge. It's going to be converted into a product, service, or idea so I get paid for it, so I get a return on my investment out of it. I don't waste my time reading something that's not going to give me a return. I don't waste my time on something that I'm not going to apply and use to serve people. Everything has a place Otherwise, I'm not prioritizing my learning, and I'm just scattering myself in the wind. By doing that, you'll accelerate it, and you'll build your unique presentation that gives you unique legacy that you're doing in the training industry or whatever health uh, professional piece you are in. But you want to build something that's, that's, that's going places, not just scattered information. One of the craziest things you'll ever do is take notes and put it on a notepad and then throw that in some drawer somewhere and never look at it again. When I take, I, what I used to do is I used to use index cards 
And every idea that I got from any source, no matter whether it's reading or listening or viewing or a live seminar or whatever, I would put them on an index card, put one topic idea per topic. And when I get home, I'd shuffle them into the topic. So I had them all organized because organized knowledge is power. And then I would incorporate it into articles or I'd put it into books or I'd put it into seminar. I'd put it into something that served and rewarded me. And that way I didn't waste my time learning anything other than it was going to build momentum. Incredibly valuable. And I think from a, from a training perspective, that in itself will immediately allow trainers, because I, I do feel that there's a lot of tick boxing going on in the industry. I've done that course, a tick. Now I'm more educated. Now I'm more certified. I'm doing this course. And when you actually look at the collection of courses, is it leading you and serving you towards what you want to do? Um, well, and, and, every, every course is valuable if it's integrated and it's serving the purpose that you're having to do, yeah. not just because you want to get a little credit, oh, I did that course too. Yes. Otherwise, people are going to think you're a master of a bunch of stuff you know, that that's scatters you. Yeah. You want to integrate that information into a primary thing that builds a momentum based on your brand and what your specialty is going to be. Mm -hmm. And John, what is self-doubt? What is self-doubt and how a lot of fitness professionals, especially younger fitness professionals, will, will either label themselves as having self-doubt, but what is it and, and how do people overcome it? Oh, I love that question. Self-doubt is one of the greatest things you'll ever have. <laughs> <laughs> because what self-doubt does is let you know that you're trying to be an authentic, you're getting out of your core competence and you're setting up a fantasy that's not real. And you're not doing due diligence to plan a, a proper plan that is congruent with what your values are. You're not doing priority and you're not sticking to core competence. You're stepping outside what you know. And it's a gift to you. <laughs> People always say, I need to get rid of this. No, you need to learn from it. Because if I set a goal and I step outside what I know, and if I don't have the courage to say, I don't know that, but I'll find out or I'll find somebody that knows the answer to that. And I try to go outside my area of knowledge um, I'm automatically going to have self-doubt. Anytime I set a fantasy instead of a true objective, I'm going to have self-doubt. Anytime I inject the values of somebody else and try to imitate somebody else, I'm designed to have self-doubt because none of those are authentic and none of those are purely the truth path that you're on. And so self-doubt is not a weakness. Self-doubt is a, is a feedback to guide you to the authentic you, the integral you, and the one that's real. So I don't, I, I have a completely different perspective on this. And people are there in the positive thinking, you know, want to get rid of that negative thinking, but the negative thinking is an essential component to let you know, you have unrealistic expectations for you to be somebody you're not in an area that's not really inspiring to you. And, and you're trying to, you're trying to be outside your core competence. And that's the second you get into it, and start with what you know and build upon what you know and put things together. That's a puzzle that you're certain about and your structure that's unique to you. Self-doubt, it doesn't become your, your, your companion You just because you're, you're clear and you keep building momentum on what is inspiring to you. It's no knowing doubt. yourself. That's why, that's why you want to start with the highest values and not try to go and do low five. Every time you do something low in your values and you're not delegating, you're going to have self-doubt. You're going to have self-depreciation. And it's, and it's a friend. It's not an enemy. It's okay. trying to let you know. Delegate that. Go, either go and do what you love through delegating or go love what you do through linking but don't do desperate things that are uninspiring to you and low in priority that are being injected by outside people you put on pedestals and injected into your life and trying to be somebody you're not. I love that. And John, I know we are quite conscious of time now, and I'd like to, if I can, ask you one question which was brought to me by a coach, and it's very, very prevalent in, in our industry. Trainers all over the world, personal trainers all over the world, the predominant clientele that they'll work with is, is weight loss. And a lot of the problems that we face with weight loss, if there wasn't any of the mind issues, the psychology, the, human, the behavioral issues that people have were not in place, I don't think that we would have the same obesity problems as, as, we, as we see nowadays. For a personal trainer who is struggling to help general population clients with weight loss, what is their greatest gift to them in order to help people to, to understand more about where they're at in terms of their struggles with weight loss and, and health? 
I worked with a fitness guru in Australia, uh, Ashley Bynes, who, who has a huge following. She'd sometimes do workouts with 1,200, 1,500 people with her at the same time. It's a wow. pretty good workout. And um, she asked me similar things. We spent a day on weight loss, just a day filming about that. Wow. And um, what I'm going to say is going to be counter to what most people say, which is not uncommon for me. The first thing I do is I, I ask people when somebody comes to me and they tell me, I got to lose weight, man, you got to help me lose weight. I'm, I, I just keep keeping this weight on. I can't do it. No one will continue to do something unless they got advantages over disadvantage, conscious or unconscious. They're doing it or they wouldn't do it. No one will do something that goes against what they believe is going to give them more advantage and disadvantage. So what people say and what they do, I pay attention to what they do, not what they say. That's the first thing I clear. Then I go and ask him, so what are the benefits you're getting out of keeping weight on and, and eating more than you need? Because I don't do a workout every single day, but I don't have, I'm not overweight. So I asked him, I said, so, you know, what is it, what are you getting as a benefit out here of, of eating more than you need and, and keeping weight on? No, it's killing me. You got to get me healthy. You got me do it. They run this story and run this racket. I go, I'm not interested in the story right now. Stop the story and answer my question. What are the benefits and advantages you're getting out of keeping your weight on? And I'd like to share a few examples. I had a lady that was, uh, you know, obese, overweight, trying to do things like swim and trying to do things to get weight down low. And I asked her how, you know, what's the benefit you're getting out of it? She said, well, everybody in my family is large. And if I don't have large body, I don't feel like I'm part of the family. That was one benefit. Second benefit was my sister's bigger than me. And um, if I'm not bigger than her, she can push me around. And I swear I'd never let her push me around again because she pushed me around as a kid. So I'm always bigger than her. The third one was I, I went on a crash diet in an exercise routine. I lost 45 pounds. I started to have a bit of a shape, a little bit of a shape. And a guy hit on me. And I had never been with a guy. And this guy um, came on to me. And I would never have that opportunity. And I thought it was love. And I made love with him the very first night we were together. And then he never showed up again the next day. He disappeared. And I found out six, seven weeks later, I'm pregnant. And I went, okay. And she said, at that moment, because I was Catholic, I had an option. Abort the baby or keep the baby. If I kept the baby as somebody I despised, I didn't want to do that because I felt like that was unfair to the child. And I wasn't prepared to do it because I wasn't economically viable. And if I did an abortion, I'm going to go to hell with my belief systems, that indoctrinization of good old Catholicism. And so in the process of doing that, she said, I had to choose the abortion and I felt guilty and shamed and I was suicidal. And I associated that with losing weight because I dropped weight. That's when it all happened. Wow. So I swore at that moment that I was never going to lose weight again, because if I did, I would end up with that risk again. So that was a motive she had. Then we found out that the last time she started to do a little bit of losing weight too, her skin got looser and it got saggy. And the more she keeps the weight on, the more beautiful her skin is. And people comment about how smooth her skin was. Anyway, we found 75 unconscious motives of why she kept the weight on. And she looked at me and she goes, as long as I have those advantages inside, I'm not going to lose weight. I said, no, that's why no matter what you do, you put it right back on. I said, we need to go and come up with viable alternative ways of getting those same benefits without having to eat. So how can you be part of the family without having to eat to keep weight on? What are other common denominators you can connect with? It says, you're just trying to around. What's an alternative way of, of not allowing her to push you around with that? And we had to come up with viable alternatives and then link those to what's highest on our values and then de-link eating to what was on our values. So she had more advantage and disadvantage not eating. And then we had to go look at the subdiction, all the pains in her life that she's feeling ashamed of. And we had to do the demartini method on each of those and clear those shames because we're dissociating from those pains and food is a way of not feeling those pains because it would make her feel better about herself. And so in the, or, you know, in, internally by eating. And so we started to go through a 13 step process, which is my, my series of steps I do for people that have so-called addictions, whether it's weight addiction or drug addiction, doesn't matter. Same principles are there. And I, they're, they're one of them, my online courses. And in the process of doing that, if they go through that process, which is what we did with her, all of a sudden she wasn't having to need those unconscious motives to keep her weight on. And her weight dropped. 68 pounds. Wow. 68 wow. pounds in a very short period of time. And it's not, they say it's not healthy, but to drop a, you know, a couple pounds, maybe a week or something. 
but she went a little faster than that, not drastically faster than that, but just kept going down because she cleared the unconscious motives. I've never seen a person keep weight on without a motive. And I know that goes against what a lot of people think. I've seen people with hypothyroid, hypothyroidism. Yeah. They go, I've got a hypothyroid problem. But usually that's because they're repressing things they want to be saying and they're not speaking up because they're dependent on somebody and fear the loss of somebody that's giving them security. And they, they're basically protecting themselves. I've seen also people that are afraid they're going to have an affair on their spouse. If they all of a sudden they lose weight, the last time they lost weight, guys were hitting on them and they almost had an affair or maybe they went out and had some kissing going on or maybe they made a love with somebody else and they go, my God, I can't undermine my family if I do that. And they'll put weight on to protect themselves from guys being on, hitting on them. They'll also do it to keep the husband from attacking them with sex. There's, there's always a motive. And until we find that motive, we're probably going to spin our wheels. And working out, as you know, you can work out, work out, work out, work out. That does, sometimes that cut covers it. But sometimes there's an unconscious motive we got to address. And until we do, we're probably going to, you know, spit in the wind, as it will. They say that, you know, even if you do a lot of workout and burn off some calories, if you've got an unconscious motive in there, your brain will lower the, thi the thyroid gland and lower the metabolic rate just to keep the weight back on again because we have a motive to keep it on. So we have to go in there and look at what those motives are. That's incredible. And that gives, again, from a, from a coaching perspective, what we often find is that the, the tactics, the training, the don't eat this, you know, the new habits are in place. When there is that subconscious pattern, that's underlying why the weight is there until that is disrupted and replaced, then in a lot of cases, it becomes a battle for people. Yes. And what happens is if you tell them that they shouldn't do something, they feel guilty and the guilt takes them into the amygdala and the amygdala takes them into the desire center and they want to eat. Yeah. So that's why you have to find out. Yeah. I see when I work with people on that, they're never wrong. Yes. I actually, when they go through and find out all the strategies and why they're using food to do that, I go, congratulations, you figured out it would do one activity to give you all those benefits. You're a major strategist. Congratulations. You can create that strategy. We can create another strategy. Let's now work on another strategy. I don't make them wrong. I don't, make them, I don't use guilt. I don't use punishment systems. That's the lowest level of motivation. I try to get them inspired by the power they have to create things, and they just didn't know they had a strategy on it. But I've yet to see any condition that's not strategic, but it's usually on a subconscious level. But if they've created something, they can uncreate it too, right? Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I had an opportunity to do a reality TV show a number of years ago at Universal Studios, and they gave me 12 outrageously crazy <laughs> individual issues to work on. I had two hours each to do it. And that's where I met that lady who was binge eating. I mean, wow. she ate more in one afternoon than I eat probably in a week. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And she was telling me how she wanted to lose weight, even though she ate two boxes of food in front of me. And that's because of her unconscious motives. Yeah. I've seen a lady, I had a woman in Houston, Texas, that was trying to get pregnant, trying to get pregnant, trying to get pregnant, no matter what she did, couldn't get pregnant, and was large and obese. So she was saying one thing, but unconsciously making sure it didn't happen. And we went inside and I said, just out of curiosity, did you ever swear that you would never want to be like your mother? And she just looked at me with a blank stare. And she goes, why do you ask me that? And I said, did you ever swear that you never wanted to be your mother? Was your mother disempowered and controlled and pushed around by your father? And she goes, you nailed my family. And I wow. said, and did you swear you never want to be dependent on a man? And she goes, God, I feel like I'm talking to a psychic here. I said, no, I'm just, I'm just seeing patterns that women have. And I said, so if you swear you never want to be like your mother, you'd want to not have kids because then you'd be trapped like your mother. But at the same time, you're telling me you want to have kids. Are you sure you want kids? So I, I, what I did is I did the Demartini method on the mother and cleared the baggage associated with the mother and the father. And I just dissolved all the emotional charges she had on that. And all of a sudden, in two weeks, pregnant, without any IVFs, nothing, pregnant by her husband. In the process of doing it, she also lost weight. Even though she was getting pregnant, she was actually losing some weight, even though she's developing pregnancy, which is mind-blowing. Wow. Because why? Because she was preventing herself from being like her mother and getting pregnant, even though she was pretending outwardly that I got to have babies. I want to have babies because my time is ticking. But once she actually cleared the issue with her mother, she would actually would brought down her weight, which she was trying to prevent her husband from being attracted to her. And she was actually trying to have um, a baby now naturally without having to do it with a force because now she's not frightened about being like her mother. And I, and I told her her mother chose with her value system to be dependent on a guy. You don't have that. You have a desire to have partly business and partly this. So you'll hire au pairs and, and uh, nannies and people to help you with this, this children. 
And once she gave herself permission on that, she actually drops the weight during the early pregnancies instead of gaining weight and then eventually caught up with her normal weight. It was amazing watching. And John, on that, one of the greatest gifts I think I've ever given to my clients, and I hope that you would agree with me, from the age of 24 to 42, I, I've been on a journey and I'm nowhere near touching the surface to my own self-mastery. And I believe that I've been able to impact and, and, and support more clients over the years with the commitment I make to myself. Um, and therefore, from a coaching perspective from trainers, if they have a complete disconnect or lack of awareness or knowledge around personal development and self-mastery, would you say that they're potentially doing their clients a disservice by not committing to that part of their own development? Well, I don't want to say it's a disservice because you draw clients that match wherever you are. Of course. You know that if you go to a seminar on nutrition, you get nutritional clients that week. Yep, you know yep. if you go in a seminar and doing uh, five building or whatever, then you know you start getting those clients. Yep. You draw the clients that resonate where you are. So I don't want to go and say it's a disservice, but I just say if you want to get most masterful, the more knowledge you have that's integrated, the more power that you'll have and the more you'll be able to serve people and you'll be kind of a, a real expert. And you, want, you don't want to be branded as some, you know, mediocre person. You want to be an expert in what you do. Specialized knowledge. Uh, you know, there's five S's of leadership. The first S is knowing exactly what your service is and being clear about that mission. Mm -hmm. Number two is gaining specialized knowledge on it in as breadth, breadth and depth as possible so people go, this person is a master. Number three is ability to speak up and reach out and speak out about what your mission is so you can leverage yourself. The next one is to make sure you can sell it in a way that meets people's needs. So you can actually communicate it in people's values so it meets their needs. So they have a higher probability of doing what the things you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then you have the next one is to make sure you save a portion of whatever you earn and reinvest in yourself because until you value you, no one else is going to value. If you're not taking a portion of your income and putting it into investments that go and appreciate value, just don't expect to have an accelerated growth in your business. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what, by empowering yourself and learning more, exactly what you said, if you would like to work with more people and help more people, it's directly correlated to the reinvestment you make in yourself to develop yourself. I and think therefore, it was, it, it was uh, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and all the leading billionaires on the planet. They did a survey on them and they found out that self-development was one of the five most important things. If you're not developing yourself and continually expanding your knowledge, entropy is going to take over and you won't keep up with the with the crowd, the people, because everybody's growing. Yeah. You have to grow faster than everybody else to be a leader. Yeah. That's your yeah. accountability. Your accountability to have that specialized knowledge accelerating. And what a great way to, to end a, an incredible interview, a one that I know will empower. And, and most importantly for me, my mission is to help trainers navigate through their career. And the purpose of this podcast was, one, to introduce them to you, because I truly do believe that your work and your mission in life is one that everybody should be blessed with. Um, and by me presenting your work and introducing you on this podcast, we've given trainers a, a, an opportunity, a gift to empower and better themselves. So um, I thank you for giving up your time. I know your schedule is extremely, very, very busy. But I also want to say to trainers all over the world that, that you're speaking all over the world, but we have a lot of trainers in the UK and you are over here doing your breakthrough experience. And I can say that it was one of the most life-changing experiences for myself and my wife, John, we both did it together and to grow together was the most enriching, empowering experience for us both to have the best life. But you're here in March. That's, is that correct? You're here in March. Is that correct? Yes. I think, I think we came up with the dates. I think 11th, the 11th or 12th to the 8th. Yeah. Yeah. So John, you're doing your breakthrough experience. Um, and I highly recommend that any coach listening to this invest in themselves. Um, and, and part of your investment is, is personal growth. And that's what this will, um, this will help you with. John, thank you so much. Could I just ask you before we leave, um, where is the best place for personal trainers to begin their learning experience with you? Some of your resources, your website, how do they find out about you? Well, the website is drdmartini.com, D-R-D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. It's an educational website, as you know, if you've been on it. Yes. It's filled with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands, in fact, of interviews and educational items. It also gives us events where I am in the world. It has the value applications. It has YouTube videos, podcast videos. It is filled with education. 
you could probably spend the rest of your life on it and not keep up with it because I'm putting new stuff on there so fast <laughs> that it's hard to keep up with. And I, I, it's there for you to grow from, and that's what it's committed to. That's what we're doing. So the, the Demartini, drdemartini.com is probably the wisest place. Thank you. Um, John, thank you again for your time. I look forward to seeing you again in March. Um, I know you've got a very busy schedule, so I'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.